Hi everybody. I recently sat down with Tyson Junker Porter, who's just released a new book called Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World, and it's made quite a big splash. Tyson's from the Apalek clan in Northern Queensland in Australia, and he's also a senior lecturer in Indigenous Knowledges at Deakin University in Melbourne. So what's special about the book is that Tyson is taking an Indigenous perspective and using that to look back at Western culture. And he's really looking at a lot of the topics like systems change and complexity that we've been exploring on Rebel Wisdom. Anybody who thinks they've got a solution or they have a plan or a design or anything like that, um, they're, they're an idiot. You, you, you can't. Dynamic systems don't operate like that. You know, you have a thing called emergence. We know this, we know the science on it. And, you know, emergence is the only thing that can deal with these kind of complexities. So all you can do is foster the conditions for emergence. Tyson also brings a really unique perspective on a lot of the cultural dynamics that we've explored on the channel. So everything from the culture wars through to economics. In any theory, if you're just focusing on a few little snippets that fit with your personal brand and you're barking those things at everyone else like an idiot, then, uh, <laughs> then you're going to be an idiot. And... Um, I, I really can't see where it's coming from, this idea that, um, that that is just a trait of the left or the social justice warriors or anyone, because I'm seeing everybody doing that. I'm seeing people who are claiming centrism especially doing that. Uh, <laughs> but everybody's critiquing everybody else in very shallow ways. And he also doesn't hold his punches when he's talking about where our current systems and trajectory in the West is leading us. You know, where you used to have family and community, now you're going to have, um, <laughs> you're going to have the economy and government, the economy and the state. And, um, and we're going to provide all the things for you that land used to provide. Um, but you have to sell us a third of your life. The trade-off is you have to give us a third of your life. Like you're going to have to spend the other third, another third sleeping. Oh, and by the way, a, a, a sizable chunk of the third that's left over, you're going to have to spend commuting, life maintenance task, paying your bills, make sure you uh, account it. Um, oh, and, and you're not going to be getting any exercise anymore, bro, so you need to set aside an hour for that. Yeah, that's all right. We're going to provide you with these little shitty indoor spaces where you can lift heavy things that don't need lifting and pedal on a bike that goes nowhere <laughs> and run even though nothing's chasing you and you're not chasing anything and you're not in a hurry. <laughs> you're going to do all those pointless tasks and you're going to do them over and over and over until you fucking die. And that's progress. <laughs> oh God. So Tyson, Jung Porter, thanks a lot for being here. Yeah, it's good to be here. Yeah. So Tyson, uh, your book Sand Talk is it's creating quite a splash at the moment um, and get, generating a lot of interest. It'd be really great to hear just a little bit about like what, what's what's the key message or some of the key messages in the book. Um, yeah, well, it's it's basically a, a reversal. Uh, usually, when people look at indigenous knowledge, it's um, it's it's examining you know the content of indigenous knowledge, you know, and uh, snippets of it um, from from a non-Indigenous perspective, or it's always, uh, even if it's an Indigenous voice, it's about trying to explain our knowledge uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, but Santorg doesn't do that. It kind of flips things around. So um, uh, Santorg is, is looking at the world from an Indigenous perspective. So it's um, taking that Indigenous knowledge standpoint and using that as a lens to have a look at what's going on in the world. Yeah, so it's kind of turning it back. It's like reverse anthropology, <laughs> really. And it's a really cheeky book. It's not done in like an aggressive way or a blamey way or like going, ah, you're like this privilege, that privilege, whatever. It's, it's kind of just fun, you know. We kind of do some thought experiments, have a few laughs, tell some yarns, and then there's a few <laughs> slaps in there just for fun too but um yeah people enjoy it it seems and it looks like i mean it really strongly invites the reader to bring their stories alongside and their knowledge alongside and amongst uh, all of that knowledge 
And so in that way, you know, it's designed to be a book that no two people would read the same book. Everybody's reading a different book when they come there because they're bringing their standpoint to that and finding a safe space to um, just experiment with that, experiment with these, these different viewpoints, worldviews, life worlds coming together. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a bit of fun. Nice. And what, what made you decide to write it? I know you have a, you know, a really, really interesting background, which you might go into in a bit, but like, what, why now? Like, why this, why now? Uh, um, I, I just, I needed the money and they offered me a $5,000 advance. <laughs> That's why <laughs> and it was work I was doing anyway, but I was just doing it verbally. You know, I had messages that have been, um, you know, I've been, given these tasks to do by elders where they, you need to pass on this message out to as many people as you can. Um, you need to get these symbols, particularly from old man Jumma in the book, uh, but several other elders as well. And lots of other people They, um, you know, so I just basically been going around and, and, uh, yarning with people for 20 years, getting those messages out there. And, um, I couldn't think of anything else to write about. So I just, I wrote about that. And I thought it would be a labor saving device. Like it would save me from having too many more yarns because they're exhausting, but no, nah, it, it's just exponentially increased the amount of conversations that I have to have. And, um, you know, and straining all of my relationships in doing so I'm, I'm on borrowed time. I'm using up all my related re relational credit here in this house. <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, I'm glad you're making it. The there's, there's people out there like vacuuming and trying to feed people and bathe people right now. Not happy with me not being there doing that. You know, are oh, you off having your yarns? Are you? That's great. Who's going <laughs> to watch this fridge? <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. So, yeah, I mean, on the subject of yarns, you, you just described really nicely the, the, the way in which sand talk and I suppose that the, the worldview you're exploring is based on many different stories coming together, you know, every, yeah. and of course, like the land has stories as well and is, and is speaking and, and teaching us. So there's all this yeah. kind of interconnection of stories and yarns, the telling of stories is a huge part of sand talk. Now, in a way it's, it's a kind of very, you know, you could see it as a very postmodern thing, this kind of coming, weaving together of many mm. different perspectives. And we've, we've spoken a little bit before, and I was really interested in your take on, on postmodernism, you have a kind of unique perspective because you you have this yeah. perspective of understanding that these kind of multiple viewpoints exist. But you're also you know you're also holding quite I think a nuanced position. And we've talked a lot on the channel and looked a lot from the very beginning of Rebel Wisdom on like looking at the culture wars and looking at this kind of tension between you know one side of the culture where there's the entities like the IDW and the others, which is, you know, described as kind of woke or social justice and this big tension between them that's happening. I think, you know, mm. we, when we've talked, you, you have an interesting synthesis around these things. So I thought it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about maybe beginning with where you think uh, postmodernism has gone too far and then going into where you think it's really offered a valuable perspective, but maybe we could start where, where you think yeah. it, it, it has gone too far in the culture and where it's not helpful. Yeah. Oh, the language of going too far is like, I don't know. It, it always makes me feel like, oh, daddy will smack, <laughs> you know, and I do hear that phrase a lot. And, 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 and it's often not with you, but um, it, it's often followed by uh, just a remarkable process of, um, of, you know, uh, critiquing, like critiquing uh, critical theory uh, postmodernism, uh, post-structuralism, deconstructivism, all these things. It sort of delivers a bit of a blistering critique of those things using the tools of critique that are just, <laughs> so I see like, um, yeah, all these downtrodden, <laughs> powerful cultural groups sort of rising up to use the victim's tools to deconstruct the victim's house or so I, I don't quite get it. Look, so you've got, um, you know, uh, critical theory, critical race theory, you know, all of these things are theories. And what is a theory? A, a, well, a theory is wrong for a start. Like that's the limit. 
and any scientist will tell you the same. Every theory is wrong, but it can be useful in certain contexts. You know, Newton's physics, it, it helps. It's helping that the vacuuming that's happening out there right now, I think you can probably hear that vacuum cleaner. You know, Newton's physics works in certain contexts, but in order for this Zoom meeting to take place, we probably don't want to go with Newton. We probably want to go with Einstein. Otherwise, the signal won't work because, you know, time changes for this, when the signal bounces up to the satellite. The further you go from the Earth, <laughs> time changes. So you're going to need Einstein for a bit. But then he, he's only good up to a point. You need to switch between theories. And I guess if you're living in complexity and dealing with complex problems in a complex world, then you need to borrow from lots of theories simultaneously. Um, so, I mean, basically, you know, if you read my book, um, and, and a lot of very conservative people who read my book and really loved it, and I, I don't think they realize that what I'm doing there is, is standpoint theory. And, and it's grounded in a lot of deconstructivism simply because these are the things that have allowed me the tools to, to come into the space. You know, um, I have problems with postmodernism, but it's mostly from an indigenous perspective. Postmodernism is placeless. You know, it's ethereal. It's floating in sp space. It doesn't, you know, all indigenous knowledge is grounded strongly in place and it's very spatial. You know, it always is. So, Postmodernism is not a good tool for that. However, postmodernism, deconstructivism, and particularly postcolonialism has been a very good tool uh, for us to be able to enter the academy and to assert our standpoint and to, to make sure that we're able to think and inquire from our standpoint, um, which is a very difficult thing to explain. But and this has given rise to lots of really good things. I don't know if you've ever heard of Misty Jenkins, uh, but Misty Jenkins is an Aboriginal woman from Australia, um, from Gunditjmara mob. And she's like, she's one of the top uh, genetic researchers on the planet. Uh, at the moment, she's got a lab where she's, she's pretty much sorting out brain cancer. <laughs> but, um, she, but she's come up with one of the, one of the very big um, discoveries that completely revolutionized genetic science. And it was her, you know, grounding in her indigenous standpoint, making room for her to be able to apply um, our patterns of logic to what she was studying and to bring in other variables that are usually out there like time and place and season and things like that. Um, to be able to bring those things in, that's what's allowed her to make those discoveries. So you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, um, most of the post-colonial and decolonizing methodologies we have in the Indigenous Academy, you know, we, we have to acknowledge uh, post-structuralist feminism uh, for their legacy. You know, um, you don't have to be a post-structuralist feminist to use those tools. You know, we pick those things up and there's a lot of problematic stuff in there. You know, and a lot of, um, you know, women of color around the world, uh, you know, have, you know, done the hard work of actually critiquing the stuff that's that's in there and trying to find more creative ways to do the work. Um, but I guess in any theory, if you're just focusing on a few little snippets that fit with your personal brand and you're barking those things at everyone else like an idiot, then... Uh, <laughs> then you're going to be an idiot. And um, I, I, I really can't see where it's coming from, this idea that, um, that that is just a trait of the left or the social justice warriors or anyone, because I'm seeing everybody doing that. I'm seeing people who are claiming centrism especially doing that. Uh, <laughs> but everybody's critiquing everybody else in very shallow ways. And when they're looking at the bell curve, um, it's great to include the outliers in your analysis because they're part of the story too. But if you just focus on the outliers, the tails of the distribution, then your analysis is not going to be accurate. So if you're only looking at YouTube videos of SJWs <laughs> when they're angry <laughs> and you're going, oh, that's what postmodernism is, then it's not going to work. Um, it's, it's not going to be valid. Where's the validity? Where's the rigor 
that you are claiming because all these people are always claiming this oh, i'm being objective and empirical the data doesn't lie so i'm going to quote one statistic out of context and make it look like all males of color are rapists and well you can't argue with the statistics i'm just being rational it's like they're in a context bros and your analysis is rubbish it's absolute rubbish <laughs> it's not empirical you're not the positivist voice of reason and empiricism and truth you're just an idiot who can't see his own standpoint and you have one you have a standpoint that is shaping the knowledge you're presenting and the analysis you're doing it's just that you can't see it it's invisible to you so you know um as I said before, it's um, Foucault ain't woke. You can't brand the entire, the entire body of knowledge that's developed over decades. You can't brand that under that one SJW that you saw on YouTube because Foucault's got his act together and the libertarian right <laughs> deploys his critique of neoliberalism, you know, very well. They never cite him, though. <laughs> you don't see them saying, oh, yeah, this is from Bourdieu. <laughs> but, um, you know, that, that, that came after 9-11, you know, with the Freedom Fries. There was an enormous backlash in the culture wars against anything French. And unfortunately, <laughs> deconstructivism, critique, postmodernism, all these things came under fire. And I don't know if you saw this in the States, but in Australia, it was just a newspaper campaign um, that basically upended the entire curriculum, school curriculum in Australia and removed anything that smacked of that evil French postmodernism because it's freedom fries <laughs> and you're going back to the reading, writing and arithmetic, you know, because that's empirical and that's, that, that's common sense, you know. <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, I find Foucault really still very useful, and, and in particular, looking at how institutions uh, exercise power, and that, that's a critique everyone's using. You know, most people are using that critique, as you, as you say. Um, yeah. you, you, know, you go into that, you go into the, the way in which our, let's say our institutions, but maybe more broadly, our entire systems are effectively taking us towards a, a kind of a zero-sum point um, you know, in Santok, it'd be, be interesting to hear a little bit about what what does that indigenous perspective um, show us that we might not see from from within our our current systems and whatever you want to call it, Western capitalism, or maybe it's probably better terms for it. Um, I, I think it's. I mean, the the most important gift is just reclaiming the uh, adaptive capacity of our species. You know, it is our unique gift you know, as the custodial species of this planet, it's our unique gift to be able to adapt uh, to massive changes and massive traumas. Um, and acceptance is just, uh, you know, it's part of our human knowledge systems. Any knowledge system that is still human and not domesticated, acceptance is, is part of that, kind of in the tradition of the Greek Stoics and all that kind of thing, you know. Um, yeah, I think that that's that's some of the unique gifts that um, that that knowledge can bring out. But uh, all that knowledge is really just human knowledge. You know, the the knowledge of undomesticated humans, how we actually are, our nature. So I mean, so inherently, uh, human beings are opposed at the genetic level um, to any kind of hierarchies, permanent hierarchies. Um, <laughs> And, and permanent power imbalances, monopolies, things like this, you know, for I mean, well over a million years, we've been living in societies that are, uh, you know, that <laughs> do not respond to that very well, you know. Um, and most of our societies are set up um, to prevent that from happening. Uh, it's, there's this last 10,000 year blip of a bit of an experiment, and particularly the last few centuries where, um, you know, that's taken over a bit, but that won't last much longer. In the book, you talk about the, the way in which Aboriginal culture is sort of geared up to make sure that narcissism doesn't take over. 
And that, that is, it's a huge part of it. You know, we were just talking about the culture wars and this, this sense of everyone thinking that they're right and everyone, you know, doubling down on reason or doubling down on, on deconstruction or whatever it might be. It strikes me that there's, there's rampant narcissism in our culture and it goes much deeper than just a particular spat on Twitter. It goes right down to the core of it. So, so what, mm. what Aboriginal culture, you know, in what ways can it help us get, get a new lens on that, on our own narcissism, let's say? Um, I, I think it's about just getting back to natural law. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, like I was saying, there is that an inherent sort of abhorrence of the idea of anybody, you know, getting one over anyone else or dominating, you know, um, the idea of one story or one point of view coming out on top and being the one story to rule them all is absolute anathema to us all at the molecular level. We cannot accept that, you know, as human beings. Um, we all hate that, but we're kind of trapped in it at the moment, you know, and oh, it's just there's such weird fractal things going on. So even you have mentioned before, you know, doubling down, um, that's a critique, an attempted critique to try and expose the pattern of communication that's going on at the moment. But as soon as we put that out there, um, Everybody picked it up, and that just became another layer to the purity testing <laughs> going on. You know, so everybody's accusing everybody else of doubling down whenever they say anything. Um, you know, it's um, yeah, it's <laughs> it's 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 just fractal um, misery. <laughs> What's going on? Misery stacked, misery stacked, misery in in all communication at the moment. And it's, it's lawless behavior because all we have is paper law, digital law, um, whatever that is, that is ephemeral uh, coming from institutions that we don't trust anymore. Um, so I think it's, you see, every time there's a disaster, people fall back on natural law. Like we always see where there's a disaster. A disaster basically, you could define it as any situation uh, that knocks the control of the state and the the mechanisms of the state out of operation for a while. That's what a disaster is. <laughs> and into that gap floods all this natural law um, uh, from the human beings and, and, and the landscape that they inhabit. Um, suddenly we just get back into it. And you always hear about it after the disasters. There's always feel good news reports about, you know, how everybody came together cooperatively and collaborated and lifted themselves out and you see people interviewed and they're not um, miserable or scared or upset about the disaster. They're kind of really excited and on a bit of a high about the, you know, the marketplace that emerged, uh, the, the sharing economy that emerged in which everybody was supporting each other and everybody suddenly found that they were all quite prosperous and all had everything that they needed <laughs> um, just through that, through that free flowing exchange with no monopolies and no controls. Um, then the state comes back in and, get, and gets control. You see it in like, you know, um, you know, when there's a coup or something, you see it in Sudan and, and places like that, Somalia, or all around the world, you see these temporary uh, disruptions uh, to all these institutions that we just don't trust anymore. Um, you see that emergence of natural law. And so that's, that's, that's just, that's what people need to get back to. But if, if anybody gives, I hesitate even to call it natural law because that's a label and then people will be purity testing on that. Just whatever you do, don't give it a name. Uh, you, you, all you can do is foster the conditions for emergence and allow it to emerge and just behave with integrity. And, you know, maybe others will do the same. But the minute you have an idea and you think this is an important idea, everybody should know about this. Everybody should be doing this. As soon as you do that, that's you've made an ideology and you're stuffed. Um, you've made a closed system and entropy is the only thing that can ensue. Yeah. So I'm curious about how, how this applies or how this could apply, because I suppose a, uh, a critic might say, yeah, but we've got all these supply chains. Like, how are we going to, without those, 
how are we going to feed everyone all of that so so what are what are some of the ways that we might rethink it rather than just going no but we need the state we need those laws etc like yeah for some people well, we're, i mean anarchy. we're already we're already starting to go oh, how are we going to feed everybody for the next decade mm. <laughs> The supply chains have been so catastrophically disrupted and they're so complicated that nobody understands how they work. So we can't just tinker them back together again. Uh, what's going to happen? So we're already there, you know, <laughs> how will we make it work? Well, you know, I guess your, your, um, your freed slaves uh, in, in the United States uh, had that same conundrum. So remember they were promised 40 acres and a mule. You remember that? Where did that go? <laughs> Forget about reparations. Just give everybody the equivalent of 40 acres and a mule. That, that'd that be good. How much does that cost now? That's worth a bit. You start that off. But they didn't get the 40 acres and a mule. They were just dumped. And so they had to like, just with the clothes on their back and the work of their hands, they had to try and build communities. Now the economic systems that they created in there communities they were a very different economic system you know they were collaborative collective and um you know these 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 really dynamic sharing economies where every unit of value every hard one unit of value had a lot of velocity within that system so although there wasn't very much wealth there there was amazing prosperity so you ended up with black wall street you know, Tulsa, all these places. And, <laughs> you know, it wasn't racism that, that caused the, the massacres and riots that followed. You know, it was basically an intolerable um, collective sharing economy, a, a different economic system emerging that was absolutely unacceptable um, to the juggernaut of the, that free market economy that was, well, not that it's a free market, with the monopolistic economy that was being created, you know, so you had, um, you had adjacent white communities that were far more wealthy, but far less prosperous than the poor black neighborhoods coming out. So they had to be destroyed, <laughs> you know? So I guess, I don't know, you'll find the answer in there. Yeah, I'm just, it, it's really striking, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking that this is, this is one of the perhaps key arguments of the, I don't know quite what to describe it, because as you mentioned, giving it a name, but let's say, well, I've called it kind of wokeism or, or like the, the kind of the now the genesis of post-structuralism, which is that certain ways of knowing um, basically oppress other ways of knowing, which I think there's a lot of validity to that. You know, what you're just describing, what happened in Tulsa, for example, of like a different way emerging and then the dominant mm. culture, what I think Renee Iser called the dominator society, and kind of coming in and, yeah. and suppressing it. You know, that is, I think, a valid aspect of it. But then there's always that balancing point, it seems, between also honoring the perspective of, say, rationality and finding some way to blend them together i mean do you think that's doable is that like what what is what's your take well, on what synthesis what what is what is it that's indicating to you that that rationality is no longer the dominant worldview i think it is i think it it, it, it is still the dominant worldview yeah sure. you know we don't need to like you know um silence all these people who are going too far to try and make some room <laughs> for the dominant ideology on the planet. It's everywhere. <laughs> it's the structure of everything from Uber to anything else. You know, it's already there. Like relax. <laughs> it's, 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 it hasn't gone anywhere. <laughs> it's still the dominant way of thinking on the planet and you have to conform to it. And, you know, you can complain to the Chinese as much as you like, but they still have to learn English in order to do business in this world. And they still have to go by the, the, the calendar of the Anglosphere. Everybody's got to go with the same calendar that starts with Jesus's birthday. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. Everybody still has to exist in the same institutions that are based on that, uh, you know, that sort of positivist framework. You know, and there are there are some things that have made some room uh, to tr to try and 
you know, see a few different points of view and to use a few other tools that will actually help. Um, you know, like I said before, even with your genetics research and everything else. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think people look at sort of the volume of the minority that are, you know, um, screaming wokeisms and, and they kind of equate that, the quality of the volume to the, the quantity of, you know, how far it's spread. It's certainly not the dominant ideology on the planet. Although, you know, I, <laughs> a lot of people just, I mean, it is the thing, you know, um, you know, Amazon might put up a Black Lives Matter sticker and make a statement, um, but it's not changing their operations. They don't have to change anything structurally. All, all they have to do is say the thing. And so everybody goes, oh, look, they're, you know, they're taking over or whatever. It's, <laughs> nothing's changed. The structure's still there. The prison industrial complex is still a thing. Yeah. You know, I, yeah, that, that's that, not that, going, that's not going anywhere. And that requires inequality. So postmodernism, uh, critical race theory, all these things, they're really just trying to bring an awareness of power to the table because power is a variable in all of these things that you want to study. And if you ignore that variable, a really key variable, then your findings are invalid. Your data is invalid. Your analysis is invalid. You do need to, <laughs> at least, like you need to factor in power as a variable because it just is. Yeah. It exists, and it's great that your opinion might be that power doesn't exist. Like, oh, what are all these people complaining about? <laughs> um, you know, that's great if that's your opinion, but that's not rational. If you're claiming a rational viewpoint and you're ignoring power, that <laughs> that's not rational, bros. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, and I th I think f for me that the critique and the understanding of the way power moves and the way it works and the way it plays out in society is the most valuable aspect of postmodernism and is why I think Foucault is so important. At the same time, I would love to get He's your thought. boring though. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, that's but, how I use Foucault is to help me fall asleep at night. It's like, <laughs> so dense. I get two yeah, pages in. And, uh. Yeah, that kind of French philosophy in general or kind of French critical theory is, yeah, it is hard. <laughs> it's quite dense. Um, but so I just wanted to kind of look at one example in particular. Like, so I, I'm with you on the, uh, on the fact that we have to look at power and we have to consider that. But again, where does it start to become its own power game is my question, right? So for example, there was this, um, there was this, I don't know if you saw it, a big spat on Twitter about the idea, the statement two plus two equals five. And it, it was made as a sort of pithy remark by I think James Lindsay, who's a very contentious character. And I also question his um, approach and, and uh, worldview in various ways. But he posted that and then other people took it up as like, yeah, two plus two equals four is, is basically white supremacy because it's one kind of rational way of knowing coming in and determining everything else. And then other people were arguing, yeah, well, hang on. Like it's also a, it's somewhat a universal through cultures and other people said, no, it's not. What would be your take on it? Because some people would look at that and go, yeah, it's important to be aware of power, but even with maths, is that valid? What do you well, reckon? Here's the thing, in indigenous knowledge, it's a lot of people think it's, it's static and, and just remains the same for thousands of years, but it doesn't. Um, we're always taking on new knowledge, but we do it rigorously. You know, things are tested very rigorously before they're incorporated. And basically the, the inquiry, the method of inquiry that we have is about drilling down to the foundational story of that new, of the thing that we're looking at. So, you know, uh, as soon as you're saying that, I I'm thinking through trying to get down to what's the foundational story here. Um, and it's seldom what people are talking about. You know, people are um, seldom, seldom angry for the reason they think. And they are never angry for the reason they say. <laughs> so, you know, um, you drill down to the story and there's lots of stories there. But the foundational story on that silly little debate because it is silly it's it's obviously you know it's a, you might call it a bad faith conversation <laughs> you know um 
but I, I guess, you know, the foundational story is well, where did those uh, numerals come from in the first place? You know, no one's saying like, you know, I, I plus I, I equals I, V, are they? <laughs> they're going one plus one. Where did they come from? They're, they're Arabic numerals. And, and that's, that, uh, that's the, the project of Westernism is to just go around the world and plunder all kinds of stuff and <laughs> to remove it from its context and build, you know, this uh, canon of knowledge that will be the center of all things. Um, so I, I would say that's the foundational, that's part of the foundational story there. So you'd start your way up. I probably want to ask uh, uh, an Arab mathematician what he thinks about that, you know, because they have lots of, I don't know, they have lots of ideas about, you know, five is unlucky and all that sort of thing. <laughs> so they probably wouldn't want two plus two to equal five. I don't know. That's just, that would be a, a fun little experiment. Um, look, I recommended to my university like the, the, they have a, a, a diversity kind of, you know, um, they, every university has this. They have a diversity program where they do all kinds of things. And I went, look, it's lovely that you've got like a poster of a girl in a hijab there. Um, that's nice, but that's not diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion would be like, you know, if, if you were targeting that segment, if you really wanted to like equally value that culture's knowledge, then you'd say, right, every research project with more than a million dollars funding um, um, has to allow this team of, of, of Arab scientists to have a second run at their data. <laughs> you know, so once you've analyzed your data and you've got your findings, you then have to submit it to this um, Arab speaking committee who in Arabic speaking their own language will go through and analyze analyze your data and see if they come up with the same findings. And that will be a test for rigor. I mean, if you really did value that culture and their knowledge and their um, facility with these numerals, which has a far longer tradition than yours, um, then give them another go at your data and see if they can replicate your results. If they can't have another look at it, bros. Um, they didn't like that idea. <laughs> that would be actual diversity and that would be productive diversity. They don't. They just want the pretty girl in the hijab on the poster, you know. Um, uh, they might they might put her on the on the board of something, or they might make her a vice chancellor or something like that, and everyone will feel good for about five minutes. But you know, you can't. <laughs> People are trying to rescue this system, uh, but then you got the SJWs on the other side. They're trying to change the system. They think that they can make this civilization fair. You you can't. So as I said before, it's like trying to make your dog into a vegan. Um, he, he's uh, one or two things is going to happen. He's going to die or he's going to eat you. You know, <laughs> this, this civilization, this system, this economic system, you know, it's a dog and he don't want to be a vegan. <laughs> Can't be a vegan. So, <laughs> So would your suggestion be that we let the dog die and that we see what happens after that? Or, or you know, we're in this yeah. situation, whether um, we like it or not, whoever we are, wherever yeah. we are. So, you know. Um, I, I don't think there's, there's, there aren't any solutions. And, and I don't know, anybody who thinks they've got a solution or they have a plan or a design or anything like that, um, they're, they're an idiot. You, you, you can't. Dynamic systems don't operate like that. You know, you have a thing called emergence. We know this. We know the science on it. And, you know, emergence is the only thing that can deal with these kind of complexities. So all you can do is foster the conditions for emergence. You know, if I was going to go straight from my own, like, psychotic ideology, I would just be like, yeah, shoot the dog. Just shoot it. Shoot it. <laughs> Get a goat if you wanted to eat veggies. Jesus. Um, that's, that's where I'd go to. But, you know, that would just be narcissism, my narcissism talking. I, don't, I can't have a solution. Nobody can. You know, that's, that's insane. There would just be another stupid, complicated, tinkered, bloody teetering, horrible, corruptible system that would come out from that. Yeah. Um, I think we're just going to have to go through all this. And, you know, if you're unfortunate enough to have stepped into the Twitter sphere and started wrestling the pigs, then, um, then 
well, I'm sorry, but you're <laughs> you're <in laughs> you done wrestled the pig, and and now you're covered in the same muck. Yeah, yeah. and it, and that's just and then that's just something you're just gonna have to go through. Um, yeah, see what you pick up when you're in there. But yeah, I mean, will emerge. Well, it, it's it's so interesting what you're saying comes right back to something we were talking about before, which, you know, this narcissism, this idea that we can control that this idea that the world is there for us to, to control rather than, you know, a, a lot of um, cultures, a lot of kind of cultures from ancient, you know, pre Socratic, you know, uh, in the West as well as around the world had a sense that we, we need to look after the sacred. You know, we are stewards of the sacred. This sacred isn't mm. just there to look after us. We look after it. And then there's a similar, I can think, uh, kind of attitude towards the world. It's like kind of, what can this system give me, 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 as opposed to surrendering and allowing it to emerge. That is so opposite to what Western culture is set up to do and the value mm. systems that that we live by. You know, so I'm just I'm just curious about what what are some of the the axioms is a terrible word for it, but what are some of the values that that Aboriginal culture would use to go, hey, chill out, you know, uh, and and be in that flow rather than trying to control it? Well, um, the terrible answer to that is that there are none, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, <laughs> they're not needed. Like, like um, you know, so so uh, Aboriginal culture at its foundation. It never separated society from nature, so it didn't have to separate all those abstracts and name those things and then come up with rules uh, to put that. The law is natural law, and the law is in the land, um, and it's it's all around you, <laughs> and you have to follow that. Um, and, and those laws are inalienable. You can't change it like a Bill of Rights or a charter or, you know, a um, – what you – in America, always talking about that. What's that document? The Founding Fathers one. <laughs> I don't know why I can't remember it now. It starts with C. Constitution. That's right. We apparently there's one for Australia too. But I mean, that's just a funny little temporary tweakable thing. You know, it'll disappear along with the paper it's written on. Um, but you know, there is permanent inalienable law, and it is in the land. It's in it's in your DNA you know, it, it's, in, it's in every natural impulse that you have. Um, and, and I guess the, the, um, the pathological impulses that people have, you know, in response to a really sick environment, a sick habitat, a sick system, that's not them. You know, a lot of people think that's our nature is that, you know, we just run around, we're just raping. Like that's what, if we're, we remove this rule of law or anything else. It's just, it's just rape and murder until we're all dead. Um, but uh, that's not what happened for the last million years. And it's been a million years of um, symbolic reasoning and meaning making at least uh, because that's the oldest uh, example of symbolic reasoning found that the, the carved shells, the beautiful carved shells from the Homo erectus um, in Asia. You know, Homo erectus was making meaning, and that's that's a million years old at least. Who knows how far back before that? You know, we do have a lot of thought and a lot of um, you know ways of being behind us. And this last five minutes is a blip. And the ways we're behaving now, these knee-jerk responses and programmed responses, these, these aren't our natures. It's it's not what's natural. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change. Which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon.